welcome to episode 22 of the, the LDG Experience podcast. Today we are discussing Chaos Undivided. Now you guys are going to have to explain this to me because I don't actually know what it is. But before we start, how are you guys doing? I am fabulous. Mm. Yes. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing well. We've got appointments this afternoon with yeah. various folks <gasps> to sort out various things. Oh, exciting. Are you fabulous and bilious? No, I'm not. I'm not. Fa- nobody else is fabulous, mm. Bile. Um, no. No, only fabulous, Bile. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, How's the streaming going? The streaming is going yeah. Yeah, well. There you go. Yeah, so no, the streaming okay, is going no. very well. Yeah. Uh, by the time this comes out, set four will be on Pixelborn, Ooh, and exciting. I will be testing out the new cards. <gasps> by the time that, I will have been testing out lots of decks. Right. I have to ask this. I'm going to ask this every time a new set comes out. Okay. Is there a song card called "Let's Get Down to Business"? Not yet. Right. In that case, Game Still Dead to Me. However. No, don't care. Game Still Dead to Me. However, there is uh, "Under the Sea" and second star on the right. And don't we don't talk about Bruno, which is from the yeah from Encanto, Encanto which is yes. brilliant, the latest no. viral hit from yes. Disney. Yes, yes, it is very good. The Madrigals are in this set. Yeah. Uh, but so like I said, so until it? until the song uh, "Let's Get Down to Business" is an official song in the game. Well, there's lines. I, I from know it. there's lines. There's lines. That's not what I said. But they are going through it though, because mm. uh, "Be Prepared," yeah, which is a, a song card from set one, mm. has now got "Teeth and Ambition." Yeah. And another line from it. So they are adding lines as they go from okay. the songs. But so I, I, at I've, some point... I've we, said the exact moment I will join the game is when they, pro- when they produce that card. But I would imagine at some point you will see Let's Get Down to Business. One day. And then that day I will come and play Lorcan. Because they did in the last set the, the bosses on a roll from um, The Little Mermaid. Which yeah. is Ursula's song. Mm. And it's it's really cool. It's a good song. Yeah. Uh, sadly, not quite good enough to see play. It's like one of those cards that if it had just had draw card written on it, mm. then it would have been really good. But the three had, greatest words in all of t- all TCGs. Yeah. yeah draw well, a card. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'd say it, it's a gain our law, gain uh, one law. Yeah. Which is good, but not good. But enough. not. It just. Mm, yeah. it's just if it said draw, look at the top five, put them back in any order, draw card. Brilliant. Mm. But um, for those friends on the other side from an earlier set. Yeah. Which is the same cost, and it says draw two cards. That's all it does, and it's a song as well. Well, so. speaking of Lorcana, yes. What else are we doing regarding Lorcana? We are doing a Lorcana podcast. She was glaring at me then. Go, yeah. <laughs> did you see how I she did. was boring did, into my yeah. soul? I'm like lasers. <laughs> I'm like, oh god, the panic. Um, yes, we are doing a Lorcana podcast, which we're recording this afternoon after this podcast. Yeah. Yes, uh, which will go up on the YouTubes. And everywhere else you find podcasts. Lazy Dragon Gaming. Hiding under a rock. Hiding under a rock. Yeah. <laughs> Down the back of the sofa. Yeah. Oh no, with God. Oh, there's a podcast. <laughs> there's a podcast and yeah. God. Oh, there yeah. we go. Uh, but yes. Yeah, Lazy socks and five pounds. Yeah. Five old pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, no, no, it's out of date. Uh, yeah, so lazydragongaming.com uh, for our website. Lazy Dragon Gaming everywhere that is social media related. Mm. Lazy hyphen dragon hyphen gaming on YouTube Ooh. because they won't let you have spaces. And the other connected version had already gone, bastards. So yeah. if you're struggling to find us on YouTube, that's why. Add the hyphen hyphens. Eight. Hyphen eight. Uh, add the hyphens and you will find us. Like a middle class woman just getting married. Yes. Hyphen eight. Hyphen eight. <laughs> we are the lazy hyphen dragons. Yes. Hyphen gamings. Because mm. we're on the third marriage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's where we can be found everywhere. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I've lost the plot. Pete! However, I am unhyphenated. What a great segue. Yeah. Yes, all my social media. Are you hyphenated? Videos. No, I'm not. I am just me. I am Onyx Dragon Gaming um, on all social media platforms and Twitch and YouTube. Um, I don't need any hyphens, spaces, underscores, anything. I am just all one word. On Onyx Dragon Gaming. I try to capitalise each other so you can at least see. Well, it is, but uh, yes. yes. We stream Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. We're going through a bunch of special characters of 40k at the moment. We just painted. Gasgol, Commander Farsight, Rebute Gilliman, uh, as a recording, which is about to start the mighty Angron Demon Primarch. Oh my word. Ooh. Yes, so I'm hoping that'll actually slow me down because I, I've been planning out, I have this plan to paint these characters like once a week, like as yeah. a weekly thing, and I end up doing them in like a stream or two, and I'm like, ah, oh, nuts. Yeah. Like, I'm chewing through these real quick. <laughs> so I'm hoping Angron being so, huge and covered in lots of stuff is yeah, going to take a while. The skulls should take a while. The skulls should give you some <laughs> pause. Slow down. It though. might not be very exciting, but it will take yeah. you some time. Exactly. So yeah, so that's Lazy Dragon Gaming for us, mm. Onyx Dragon Gaming for Pete. And today, Pete, yes. we are talking about Chaos Undivided. Because yes. we've done the four gods. Indeed. Now, for Eevee and anybody else... Mm. Uh, undivided is basically just the followers of chaos. They, they don't, don't. They, they don't, haven't pick a lane. They don't pick a lane. Yeah. 
they they follow. Them. They're angry. They're horny. They're sick, and they're uh, and and they occasionally like to learn. Read things. a book. Yeah. Yeah. Obsessed about things. Yes. Yeah. So they're See, just obsessed with yeah. everything. This is one of my one of my jokes. I remember I made my way. I'm gonna say a little random anecdote is way way back in the day. I was I was like on when forums were a thing. Oh, it was all Reddit when individual forums were a thing. My word. Yeah. Um, I remember making a statement that um, that Conan the Barbarian because I've just been watching that a lot. And I was like Conan the Barbarian is a champion of chaos undivided. So the symbol of chaos undivided is an eight pointed star. Mm-hmm. For those people who don't know. Yes. And one of the things that they end up one of the sort of Decorations Conan has wearing is an eight-pointed like thing, thing around his yeah. neck. Like, you can kind of lean into it and say, and I and I argued that he was he was he was a he was a champion of chaos undivided because obviously he is a mighty warrior, so therefore he's that's corn. He gets laid like three times in an hour and a half yep. in that movie. Slanesh. So that's Slanesh. Um, at the beginning of the movie, he sat on that throne in a big thinking pose. So he's clearly contemplating and knowledge and things. Yeah. So that's Zinch, and uh, he he gets like really. Like completely so tired he can barely hold up and looks a bit ill so I'm assuming that's Nurgle well he doesn't get poisoned at some point and survive yeah yeah so he yeah. certainly does yeah so that's yeah so Conan is a chaos champion of under, a chaos undivided champion yes. so yeah they, they, they basically comes down to they don't really like worship one of the gods individually but they sort of worship them as a pantheon yes so yeah these are like your they were like the Greeks or the Romans would have done yeah so like there are obviously people who are like I really like Poseidon I do a lot of sailing so I'm going to really focus my worship on Poseidon and then there are people who are just like I, lots of things happen to me <laughs> so I'm going to like <laughs> appease everyone um, and make sure that I don't piss any of them off yep. so that Zeus doesn't come down and do something horrible with my wife yep. um, again yes um, so <laughs> With Chaos Undivided, we're going to start yeah. with 40k. Yes. Because it's the easiest one. It is, yes. Uh, and this all starts with a character called... Log- a massive bellend. Called, <laughs> called Logar Aurelian, or the Horizon. Yeah. He is the Primarch of the Word Bearers. Technically, it starts with an even bigger bellend. Well, does it, though? Yes. Is because it Erebus it's Erebus. Is, yeah, Erebus it's, it's Erebus. Called? Well, technically, Corferon. Yeah. So Corferon is a, um, is a human. Yeah, he's technically not a marine because he was too old to be turned yeah, into a marine. So he was enhanced, but the thing about Corfax, so Lorgar, when the Primarch was scattered, Lorgar ended up on a planet called Colchis, yes, which was ruled over by various priest kings, if I remember rightly. It was a very religious planet, um, and Corferon kind of found the young Lorgar and sort of took him under his wing um, and sort of encouraged him to become uh, an amazing demagogue and like prophetizer, etc., etc. And but also secretly behind his back worshipped the chaos gods. Yeah. Then when I think it was a young young chap. Then when they were, sorry, the Lorgar was found, a young chap by the name of Erebus became a space marine and part of the Word Bearers Legion. And Erebus is just the biggest bell end in the whole of 40k. Like, nobody likes him. Like, like even the bad guys. Yeah. Like, at one point, Horus cuts his face off just because he's really sick of his shit. Yeah, so the, the Lorgar was found on Conquist mm. by a nomadic tribe of outcasts known as the Declined mm. under the chieftain Fang Morgal. Mm. And they named him Lorgar, which means a uh, rain caller. Corferon, so he was already grown up when Corferon, an exile priest of something called the Covenant, and he sort of just sort of started to tutor. He was like, like some sort of Grand Vizier. Yeah. And that can never go wrong. No. Ever. So, in any story. Um, Grand Viziers are always trustworthy. Yeah, so basically Corferon really early on shows his, yes. the way he's going on by convincing Lorgar to kill Fang Morgal mm. uh, and cover it up, basically. So that that's, gives you an idea of yes. uh, what's it. But, uh, yeah, the, the planet that he's on uh, sort of moulds him into a religious nutcase. Yeah, essentially. very f- much fanatical. Like, yeah. Very fanatically religious yes. planet. Mm. where and, and they are, there's, I believe... There's um, a prophecy. There yes. we go. Got there. There's, always, there. A, there's, there's always, always a prophecy. A prophecy. And the prophecy is of essentially comes down to the emperor arriving to reclaim Lorgar. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and of course, the emperor does arrive to reclaim Lorgar. And everyone's like, "It's the prophecy." And the prophecy has come true. So obviously, yeah. Corferon was right. This prophecy yeah. was correct. <gasps> What a shock. Mm. Uh, I go- wonder where he got that knowledge from. Yeah. <laughs> so then we go through a little bit into mm. the Great Crusade. Yep. And the Great Crusade is really important from all the different Primarchs' perspectives because yes. they all do things differently. Yes. They all achieve things in a different and way. And Lorgar, being Lorgar, yeah. does things wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so Lorgar, rather than sort of taking a planet 
like, being like, cool, this is the imperial truth, religion's full of shit, science and technology's great, welcome to the fold, whether yeah. you want to or not, yep. here's some technology. He's like, hey, see how powerful we are? Well, my dad, he's a freaking god. Yeah. He's that powerful. And you know what you should do? You guys should worship my dad. You should, you should, you should treat him as a god, and we should all... The most important thing to do is build massive temples and dedicate your lives to his awesomeness. Yes. And he starts doing that all over the galaxy. Very slowly. And that's what gives him away. Yeah. So what gives... Like, like for example... Because it takes a lot of time to turn people into yeah, religious so nutbars. Convert an entire mm. planet... Into frothing fanatical nut, yeah. nutcases. And at the first, he is literally saying, my father's a god, worship my father. Yeah. So he's very slowly making his way across the galaxy, converting mm. entire planets to the worship of the Emperor. Yes. However, what he doesn't know is, this really isn't helping. No. It, because what the Emperor's trying to do is do away with religion. Yes, to because th- it weakens the borders of reality. Yeah, so yeah. Get, and strengthen the borders of reality, keep the Chaos Gods weak, and mm-hmm. then he can go and finish them off, use the webway so they're not getting any power from anywhere. Yeah. And then be like, haha, screw you. Screw you guys, you're, you're nothing now, we've won. Yeah. However, because Lorgar is building entire planets and forcing them to worship the Emperor, there's, some of them are obviously getting it This wrong. is causing a disturbance in the Force. Yeah, so eventually the Emperor says, Lorgar, son, why are you like a dozen or more planets behind your brothers in the whole conquest of the galaxy thing? Yeah. And Logar's like, I don't know, it's slow, I'm not sure. It takes a while, mate. It takes a while. Not that Shut up, good. Dad. Shut up, Dad. At which point the Emperor goes, I'll have a quick look at the ones you've you've yes. um, you've done. Or it might have been Malkin or the Sigiline. Well, no, no, this is you think this is what's really cool. Because it all comes to a head on a planet called Monarchia. Monarchia, yes. Where the, Oh, of course. Yes, where the almost the entire Ultramarines Legion <laughs> is sent to a because they're like, oh crap, you've really fucked this planet up. So the only solution because they're all now religious fanatics, and we all know what it's like, you you have to kill every single fanatic to get yes. rid of that sort of n- craziness. So they're like, shit. So they effectively wipe out the population of Monarchia and, like, destroy it. And Lorgar's like, what the fuck, Ramute? <laughs> like, I did this! So uh, I think the way I recall this going mm. down is that he'd spent so long building this temple to yeah. the Emperor on, on Monarchia... Mm. The, like the emperor was like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, like let's, it let's out. go yeah. and have a look. Mm. Turns up, summons all the word bearers mm. and makes them kneel. Well, no, this is, is, I just, that, the, is the fun part. Is you have so he gets angry at Rebuta Gilliman and right. Malkador's there. Oh, okay. Like sure. Malkador's with Rebuta Gilliman. He's like, "Look, this is not what your father wants. Yeah. You know that. What the f are you doing?" <laughs> uh, and and Lorgar's like, oh, "Shut up! You're not my real dad. <laughs> like you can't say that. You don't know what he thinks." <laughs> Um, not realising that he is also there. Yeah. Um, he then descends from the shuttle and is like, yeah, you're done fucked up, son. And now I'm going to make you... Really, like, you will all kneel and watch as we break this, you know, leave no stone left upon another yeah. type, type thing to really drive home the point that you shouldn't be doing this. So yeah, they kind of it all comes to a head. Uh, it's quite a cool story. It's, it's in the it's in the book The First Heretic. Yes. Um, which is one of the, the, the better... Uh, uh, um, heresy novels. It is. It is very because it charts the whole story of the first heretic. Is it charts the fall of Lorgar? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously this happens. Lorgar goes off and sulks. Yes. And that's when Erebus and Corfarum kind of come to him and like, hey, gods are cool, right? Religion's cool. You just picked the wrong one. Maybe your dad's not a god. Maybe he's just a twat. However, I know of some other gods who are pretty chill, pretty cool. They were also young, hip happening dudes yeah. in the style of youth preachers everywhere. Yep. Um, and they, yeah, basically shares the sort of knowledge of the powers, the the, the pantheon, the chaos gods. Um, and Lorgar's like, hmm. Tell me more. Yes. <laughs> so they end up trekking to the what is effectively Cadia. They, they yeah. trek to yep. Proto Cadia. Um, and they enter the, some of them enter the Eye of Terror, because this is where they come back as the Galvorback. Because they get merged with demons. And all sorts of weirdness happens. Yeah, There's a lot more stuff that happens. It's like quite detailed. But the point being is, Lorgar's like, screw you, Dad. If you're not going to let me worship you, I'm going to go <laughs> find my own gods with blackjack and hookers. Um, and, in, in, and blood and pus. Exactly. Yeah. And then, then yeah, so that's... So then he's like, cool. Well, well, I'm a wimply, noodly kind of Primarch. Because he is. He's 
fucking useless. So he's I mean, he's where, physically the one of the weakest. Yeah, primates. I'm, I'm pretty like where the others all had to like grow up really quickly, both mentally and physically. Yeah, Logar grew up in the say, scale of, of size. Yeah, but he, it was all about the religion. It was about his voice his, and his uh, like yeah. his ability to talk and, and yeah. persuade. Whereas, sort of like Rogal Dorn, for example, the they f- were fighting on the, on the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the whole time, like Lehman Russ, mm. non-stop fighting. He, he is one of the physically weakest of yeah. the Primarchs, and um, so yeah, he's kind of a bit of a drip. So he's like, well, chaos is clearly the thing, but I can't be the figurehead because I'm a, a pussy. Yeah, so. That's when they come up with the idea of turning of using Horus because they're like, well, he's really arrogant and he's been made Warmaster, and I reckon we can exploit that. That's when they come up with the plan and they send, and he sends Erebus off and all the shenanigans on Davin happens and obviously then the Horus Heresy happens, etc., etc., etc. And this is also where Lorgar kind of gets like he starts getting powerful because he starts writing the Book of Lorgar. Yes. Which is just his ramblings about chaos, basically. If you've, if you've ever read any ridiculously long fan fiction online, you have nothing on Lorgar. No. Like, there's like, at one point in the Heresy, I think it's like, the book of Lorgar is like 34 volumes long, or something, at that point. And he makes a bunch of really pretentious sets for everyone. Yes. He's like, I wrote this, and I made this one that's made in like human skin for you, Fulgrim. And I made this one that's bound in iron for you, Perturabo. Um, and everyone's just like, thanks, I guess. Yeah. Um, Cheers. Yeah. That being said, though, mm. the Book of Lorgar does actually play an enormous part in the the scaling of the current Imperium. Well, the proto book. The proto, Lorgar. the first one. Before the Book of Lorgar, yeah, when it was about the Emperor. So when he, he wrote his new one about chaos. Yes. And he was distributing those, like... Um, to everyone who were going, well, we don't really read, dude, but thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, and we already know all this. Also, so, yeah, it's not off. So I don't want to read your fan thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all good. We, we know what we're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, before that, he wrote a book about the Emperor in the same vein. Yes, which is known as the Lecticio Divinitatis. Now, anybody who's read the Heresy will probably go, ooh. ooh. Because this kind of ends up, like, being, starts being circulated, when, circulated amongst the regulars. The, the normal human folk, quite secretly, because obviously rel- religion is banned, especially worship of the emperor. So, but unfortunately, people being people, <laughs> yeah, R- Lorgar is directly responsible for the creation, what eventually becomes the ecclesiarchy and the church of the emperor ascendant, which it's- is kind of both good for him because obviously the religion thing does weaken the boards of reality, um, which helps other things, but also it's bad for him because obviously then allows the kind of ridiculous acts of faith which allow basic human mortals to F up demons. Yeah. Um, uh, which is, uh, there is one instance of this where one of the very first followers of this religion that is uh, forming... What's uh, Euphrates Keeler. The Euphrates yeah, Keeler. She's, she's like a photographer. Yeah. Uh, she's documenting the Great Crusade. And yeah. she banishes a demon. She does, yes. Using the, the f- her faith in the emperor. emperor. Yes. Um, and that's the first... Acknowledged, yeah, probably the first sort of ever acknowledged miracle, miracle involving the, em- the faith of the emperor. Yeah. So before, even before the emperor is on the golden throne, because yes. he's not there at this point. Yes. There's enough faith going around the legions and the supporting Astra Militarum troops. Yeah. That the emperor is starting already to like funnel faith into power to banish demons. Yes. So it's because of Lorgar, yeah. he's on his way at that point. Well, and it's this a- it comes to a head because as we found out for spoilers for the uh, Siege of Terror books, is that this apparently was also part of the plan. Oh, I see. Yes, because there is the prophecy of the Dark King. Oh, there's always which is, more prophecies. Yeah, so this prophecy of the Dark King is like this fifth kind of chaos god, which is more powerful than all the others and would, could destroy all of them. Right. And take over I see. as the preeminent de- sort of deity. Um, a lot of people think this is Horus, ah. but actually, it's it, it. Well, it could be both, but the kind of backup plan is that Erebus explains is it was the emperor. I see. In the, in order to defeat Horus, he had to basically accept and just go. All right, fuck it. All this because he's been denying his divinity. Like yes, both in vocally. But also actually. I see. Like he has been, there is a large chunk of power that he has access to. Oh, okay, okay. That yes. he has not been accessing. 
I see. Because he knows that if he takes it on himself, he would then lose all of his humanity. Even though he's a way put, like he's yeah, he still is human at his core. But if he took this power on, he would then transcend and become this thing, right? So he thinks he needs this to defeat Horus. This comes to a really, it's one that is, it is actually one of the better parts of the Siege of Terror because one of the sort of minor characters who is a part of a group called the Perpetuals, who are something we'll go to another time, but basically they're immortal. Um, and this guy knew the Emperor way, way, way back when. Um, his yeah. name is Alanius Pius. Yes. He becomes the patron saint, ironically, of the Imperial Guard because he's just a guardsman at this point. But he has been, he was on the Argo. With the Argonauts. Oh, right, okay. With from Jason. Greek mythology, yes. yes. Yeah, that's, one of, yes. that's one of the things he did. Ah, um, yes. Yeah, that's one of the things we know that he did. Ah. He was also the Emperor's first war master. Ah. At the Tower of Babel. Ah, okay. Yes, because apparently the Tower of Babel was the, I believe, the proto Nuncio language, which is like a weird chaos language that you can use. You, if, you, if you can say the words, you, it like causes ridiculous amounts of... You can distort reality and stuff with them. Oh, okay. But they're words that you should not be able to say with the human vocal cords. Ah, I see. So they yes. really wreck you up as well. Anyway, yeah, because apparently this is when he split with the other. Anyway, that's irrelevant. But the point being is, <laughs> uh, old person, as he's known at this point, comes before the emperor as he's taken on this power and basically goes, dude, you can't do this. Uh, you need to stop. Yeah. You need to put this down because you know... That if you do this, you will go on and become... You will lose all humanity and then you won't be able to relate to the people and all your dream will die and all humanity will be assumed to your, like, glory, etc, etc. Um, and the Emperor does, eventually. Like, after this compelling argument, the Emperor casts off this power. And this is the part that, em that Erebus and that weren't expecting. Yeah. Because they were hoping the Emperor would be like, ha-ha. They were like, we've set up Horus as this, like, super being, and then in order to beat the super being, the emperor will have to become an even more super being, um, and then he will become ascendant, and it will usher in this, he'll become the dark king, and we'll all be, like, under his power and everything, whatever. I don't know why they wanted that, but apparently they did. Um, but the emperor's like, no, I won't do it. So that's, yeah, that apparently was the plan. Right. Or, the, or part of the back of the place. Part, part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. All the plan all along. All the so the Emperor, that's why the Emperor knows he's going to die. Because he's like, well, I kind of... I can't use that power, so I'm going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Yeah. By into playing, the Golden by Throne. By playing Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Apparently. Um, uh, into the Golden Throne we into go. Into the Golden Throne we go. So yeah, yeah that's how that happens. So, right. yeah. And then, ironically, he kind of ends up with more of that power because it's of the faith that's directed towards him. Yes. Makes him... And this is where we believe yeah. the Emperor is starting to split yes. now in the 42nd millennium, where you've got almost two entities that are Yeah, you've the got Emperor. the physical being, the physical oh. shell On the that, that he's been holding the webway open, closed for 10,000 years, yep. and creating the Astronomicon and all those sort of things, and doesn't really... He's just all been focused on that for 10,000 years, kind of burnt out all humanity, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, tethered to that by like some sort of very frail thread, at least we believe anyway. Yes. Um, there is this being out in the, the warp or some other dimension that is the, the manifested, the rest of what his spirit was combined with all the belief that and is empowered with all the yeah. belief from all the all this worship and making, of course, the the God Emperor. Yes, that everyone, which prefers. was a prophecy used to be known as the Star Child way yes. back when. In, was it? yeah, in in there's a lot of really old law, like a lot, so, a lot yeah. of old law that they don't use anymore, mm. where including the Emperor's kids. Yes, there was none of that. Yeah, they, they the Emperor don't. had a bunch of kids that, that were running around like yeah. in the galaxy over the course of before he became. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. obviously he'd been around for a long time, yeah. so to imagine that a man had not gotten down in thirty yeah. thousand no, no, years no. is is beyond miracle belief. Was that not? Supposed to be, the, were they not the perpetuals? I think I think that's where that? the idea for the perpetuals came yeah. from. Um, and then they just sort of retconned that away and just made them. Yeah, they were called the sensei, I believe. Yeah, I believe they were called like the sensei. Um, um, anyone who's older than me will might be able to correct. Yeah, me, the, 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 that bit is before me, but it's I do way know, way back. I do know it's really one of those like things I remember hanging around, yeah. like the gods of law. Yeah. Because they used to be the opposite of the gods of chaos, but we won't go into them. No, because they, they are well and truly dead. Yeah, they've, they're long gone. But yeah, so that's Lorgar. So yeah, then Lorgar, Lorgar kind of as as happens when everyone buggers off to the the warp uh, into the Eye of Terror, he eventually ascends and becomes a demon prince. Yep, and continues fucking shit up over the millennia. Along with so, as far as I know, Lorgar is one of the few that has not remanifested. I don't believe so. He's so mostly... He's, the he the, is currently... It's mostly Corferon and Erebus. Erebus that go out yeah. and do stuff yeah. in, in the sort of... Lorgar, as far as I know, is sat in his Writing tower, his fanfiction. Writing fanfiction. Forever. 
yeah. sulking and sucking his thumb that it didn't go the way he wanted it to. I don't think he's always sucking. He's just, I think he's just obsessed with his fanfic. He's Maybe. just like constantly writing the book of Lorgar and wanting to transcribe and thinking he's the greatest. He's, I think he's like so much as sucking his thumb. He's just like doesn't thought, care. All really. oh, right, okay. He, I thought he, he goes in a mild that he, he might do because yeah. he's a whiny little bitch most yeah, exactly. of the time. But as he sort of ascends and becomes all like more powerful, he's like, oh, I'm. I'm so much better now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so he's the first of the sort of neutral... Yeah, he was... Um, and it's, it's basically what everyone blames Lorgar. Yes. Basically. It's it's his fault. The Heresy's well, yeah, his it, fault. Yeah. The, the chaos... It's the triumvirate, really. It is Lorgar, Corfair, and Erebus' yeah. fault. If they'd have just like put yeah. an end to that, probably... Especially yes. Erebus. Like, if you read any book with Erebus in it, yeah. you can see right away that that guy is not a good guy. He's the most, like, he's the most <laughs> asshole character. Like, like I said, even the bad guys. Like, he's got, like, plans to fuck over most of the bad guys yeah. as well. Like, that's what's so fucking stupid about Erebus. <laughs> he's like, nobody likes him. I mean, nobody likes him. Like, it's, it's so funny. Bad. Like, anytime I ever play the Horus Heresy as a tabletop game, if anyone's playing Word Bearers and they've got Erebus in their army, I don't care what the art, what the <laughs> the goal of the mission is. I don't care if I lose by a million victory points. If Erebus is dead, I consider it a win. Yep. And I feel that should be a rule. Yep. Like, you win the game if you kill. Yeah, if you Erebus, kill Erebus, Corfair, doesn't Lord, matter. Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah. Lord, Lord, like Lord. even Corfair is not. Corfair is just like the thing about Corfair is he's just like your classic like. Jafar. Um, He's just yeah, he's pretty, he's just a classic moustache twirling villain. Yeah, like there's literally a moment with that where he's got Gilliman at his like thing, and he's all like, ha, 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 I have finally caught you, Ramute Gilliman. I will do horrible things, and I will sacrifice you to chaos and all these things." And Gilliman's just like, "If you've got a Primarch at your mercy, just kill him." <laughs> and then he rips out Corvero's primary heart at that point. He's just like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like. Yeah, why? He, why did I monologue? <laughs> yeah, he literally is your classic mustache twirling There'll Disney a, villain. I have it's tied Colferro. this Primarch to a train track, and there will be a train along and another yeah, yeah. train. Yeah. But I will leave. <laughs> and make sure now because I know this will happen. Yeah, that's literally Corferon. Yeah, like I think he probably has a villain song. At some that would point. be fabulous. Yeah. yeah, he probably has this big epic m- number <laughs> about how his machinations have brought about the heresy or something. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, that anyway, they yeah. need to do the musical uh, yeah. Corferon. Just Corferon from the musical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very quickly to touch mm. on the fact that uh, Corferon was too old to be a space marine. Yes. There are a bunch of these around the time. Dotted, of, yeah. So uh, like, the other biggest one is, is probably Luther, Luther. Um, yeah. the, the second in command of the Dark Angels Legion. He yeah. was too old to receive. The, the gene seed, but was given like a lot of these guys were given like a lot of genetic enhancements and kind of um, upgrades and things that makes them on par with the space marine, but not quite. Yeah. So they don't really have the, the long life and stuff. Yeah, they, 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 they have they, a longer life, but they they will theory, die. But they, yeah. like with space marines, we aren't sure. If well, they the are. OG was, it's very heavily hinted that the OG space marines from the Heresy era. Are functionally immortal. Yes, but as the gene seed has degraded over thousands of years, that they have not been. Mm. But obviously, it's kind of hard. Like, not a lot. Of, there's not a lot of space marines that kind of die in their sleep. No, you know, so it's kind of hard to tell. I I, there is, as far as I'm aware, no space marine has ever died of old age. Yeah, that I know. I, I'm. I don't want to. I'm not going to 100 percent it because it's probably a little box somewhere. They were like. Grandmaster so and so, you know, like finally went into the long sleep. Or yeah, something. yeah. yeah like, um, but like that, but the, but the fact that Dante is so physically old. Yes. At the age he is, like that's the thing that was now seventeen hundred years old. Yeah, and everyone's like, oh my god, you look like an old bastard. Yeah, like like a well, proper old bastard. He's, he's yeah, yeah. But the point but before point. he cr- before he yeah. went across to becoming a Primaris Marine, mm. Dante was at fifteen hundred ish years yeah. old. Was starting to look worn. Was out. really starting to look old. Yeah, well, that's the whole point why wear the world the mask of Sanguinis yes. for so long. Yeah, he was um, when he took the mask off. Everybody immediately was went, like, whoa, "Whoa, dude, you old! You old!" Like yeah. you can tell. Mm. Um, and I think, other than that, the prime, not the prime, the uh, the chapter master of the Grey Knights is pushing it on a bit. Caldor Drake, Caldor Drake, but he's been in the warp and out. Yeah, yet. but he's currently being talked to Samuel Becker. He's yeah. leaping from battlefield to battlefield, hoping the next leap will be the leap home. Yeah. yeah. So we're not sure. He could be like 12, or he could be like 12. Yeah, because the way the war works. Because that's the other thing that makes it. Anyway, moving yeah. on. Moving on to the next Primarch. The next demon, the next demon Primarch Evo, is Undivided. Evo, undivided is Perturabo. Yes. Another the Primarch who I don't think has ever bothered to leave Nope, he's a Madrengard, which is the name of the planet yes. the Iron Warriors settled on. So he is the Primarch of the Iron Warriors. He's he's happily building like 
Mimic is basically yeah. He that's, is. That's literally what he's he's yeah. uh, in the in the novels for the Horus Heresy. That's like his thing. Yeah. Is he builds literal miniatures, the like working work. miniatures yeah. of like Warhammer times and stuff. Yeah. yeah. He uh, basically falls to chaos because just he, by default, he almost. just doesn't like. Rogel Dawn or his treatment at the hands of his father. Yeah, they keep being compared, like, and he doesn't like the fact he's being compared to Rogel Dawn, yeah. and therefore it's like Rogel Dawn's awesome. Yeah, and um, you're grumpy. It's like, unfortunately, you're really good at garrisoning things and like yeah. building these things, so we're going to want you to do that. Yeah. And he gets bored of that. Yeah, he's basically he, like. Yeah, he's just a gr- whiny old bitch. Is well, he, he does get the shitty end of the stick, though. Yeah, but he does bitch about it constantly. Yeah, because it's like everyone loves Rogel Dawn and thinks he's yeah. wonderful, but Per Rabo is just as good. Yeah, but he acts like a knob. That's the point. Well, like he... Rogel Dawn's at least like he's talkable. Like talk to him. I'm not a bit the big Rogel Dawn's biggest fan, but Pedro doesn't help himself. No. Like he, he he what he does like whenever I talk about it, rather than going like having a bit of a light hearted banter, like which of us would be like better in a fight, you laying siege to a fortress I made or vice versa. Yeah. He's like, oh, fuck you, I'm my room, read my books. <laughs> like that's Pedro Rabo. I'm gonna go. And when there's two of you like that, people are like, oh, for fuck. After a while, people are just like, fuck's sake, Pedro Rabo. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the big thing was that the Iron Warriors yes. uh, were fantastic at sieges. Yes. And uh, they would send the Iron Warriors into the shittiest battlefields. And the Iron Warriors, in Perturabo's defence, because I do have a little bit of time for him. Oh no, I have have respect for him. The fact that his doctrines on Siege Warfare are still in the Codex Astartes. Indeed. Uh, However... They were he would lose marines at an exponential rate mm. because they were sent to the most yeah. g- like god awful places to lay siege to the most secure fortresses, mm. and when you're doing that over and over, but he's also and over but he's also again. the other bit that really got him is the fact that he was asked to then after planets were conquered and stuff he was the one that was tasked with building new fortresses for yeah. like garrison stuff and garrisoning said fortresses so he kind of gets the shit end of both days yeah. like he's he's um, in the forlorn hope he's like basically the forlorn hope and he's also <laughs> yeah. having to stick around and you know, repair tidy everything up. he just yeah. knocked over mm. um, now he is uh, I don't know if there if Perturabo has any good friends amongst the other Primarchs but I know he hangs around quite a bit with my friend and your friend Fulgrim and huh. Fulgrim yeah, until Basically. Fulgrim stabs him in the back. Until Fulgrim says to him, come on, we're going to go and have a look at this planet yeah. over here. Yeah. And basically there's a really cool scene, I love it in the in the, in the book, where uh, the, the, the thing of this is Fulgrim becomes a demon Primarch. Yeah, because he tries to sacrifice, he, used, he tries to use Perturabo as a sacrifice to make himself a demon. Yeah. But on the way there, they're travelling through the walk to get mm. to an Eldar Chrome World. world. It's an old Chrome World. Chrome World yeah, now. Is, yeah. It was a maiden world. So a Chrome World is basically one of the worlds that got kind of wrecked. Sucked in. Yeah. Well, not, they don't always get sucked in, but they get, they're get they around the edge of the Eye They're the yeah. ones that kind of got had all life drained from them. Yeah. So like all the people on there just got deaded yeah. in the worst possible ways. And then they just left as like these empty tombs. You sort of, you know, neutron bomb. Like, you look at some of those, like, post apocalyptic things. They're a bit like, yeah. yeah. You imagine it's a post apocalyptic wasteland, except that there's no overgrownness because it's just, there's nothing there. Nothing <laughs> there. And on this particular uh, chrome world are a bunch of uh, salt stones. Yes. And they're all locked in to this world. Yeah. Fulgrim knows about it. He needs a big sacrifice in order to become. And obviously, Sinesh loves, him, lo- loves themselves some Eldar spot souls. So he's like, come on, brother, we are going to go and find this weapon that will help yes. Horus win the war. And Perturabo's like, oh, fine, whatever, a, sounds a good. New weapon, I, I like that, yeah. really cool. Let's go and get this thing. Mm. So they're going through the warp, and Perturabo mm. is in his quarters, and he summons Fulgrim from, for, to him, and he says, uh, I would like to show you this thing I have built. And this is where you get the, uh, yeah. the working model. Of the Warhound. Of the Warlord Titan that yeah. he's just finished. He's like, yeah. And he's like, look at what I've built. Isn't it marvellous? Yeah. And and Fulgrim's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool, brother. That's, that's fine. He says, no, no, brother. Look closely <laughs> at the model of the Titan and you will see the amount of work I've put in. So, of course, Fulgrim sort of needs his brother, needs to be nice to him. And yeah. He's like, he sort of goes... Yeah, okay, and he leans in, and as he leans in, Perturobo grabs him by the hair and smashes, smashes his in. face into the Titan yeah. and holds him on the table. He says, look, 
I don't know what you're doing, but, like, but I know go, you're lying you're to doing, me. Yes. So you better start talking. Yeah. And it's like, and at that point you realise that all the way up to this point, Perro has been, yeah, let's go and get the weapon. Yeah, mm. it's all good. And then you suddenly realise that Perturobo is not an idiot. Yeah. And he actually knows that Fulgrim's trying to do something. Yeah. Fulgrim manages to talk his way out of it. They get down to the planet. Big ritual starts. Fulgrim. And then he does do that. Aha! I was, it was a trap all along! And Pedro was like, oh no, oh, I did not see, see this coming. coming. Uh, so Fulgrim tries to sacrifice Pedro yeah, Robo. Pedro gets like, away. Being a stubborn twat, he's yeah. just like, hell no, no I'm not going to die. Yeah. Fulgrim completes the ritual using the soul stones yes. rather than Perturabo. Mm-hmm. Perturabo legs it yeah. and they uh, leg it out and he obviously then later on yes. Perturabo becomes a demon primal. But that yes. is that is my I love the I love the moment in that story where Perturabo is like, I am not an idiot, I yeah. know you're doing something. He has another similar moment in the Siege of Terror with between him and Abaddon. Right. Where they're both like, This is not our war anymore. Yeah. Like, because Petro was like, we're here, supposed to be here as brothers and brotherhood, and we're overturning my, our father because we be- don't believe in his vision, etc., etc. But this is still about humanity. And he's like, this is not our war anymore, this is their war, referring to the chaos gods and demons yeah. and things. Um, and Abaddon's like, yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's when Pertrabo is like, yep, and I'm sick of it. I ain't playing this game no more. And that's uh, when he packs up and fucks off. Here. He literally is like, I ain't playing anymore. And what like, doesn't help him come to this realisation is that... Uh, when it comes to the Siege of Terror, mm. which is a really big siege, guess whose legion is at the forefront of trying to break down Rogal, Rogal Dawn's fortress, yeah. the, the fortress of the Emperor? Mm. Horus sends Perturabo. Well, the, well, the thing is, he, he thinks, because he wants to, he wants to do it, yeah. and, but he thinks he's in charge of the siege, yeah. because that makes sense. That's his fucking specialty, yeah. and it's his final chance to like prove that Rogal Dawn's not as good as him. And yeah, he keeps fighting and fighting. But the problem is, is Horus keeps doing things like, oh, well, let the Death Guard go off and do weird shit over here. And yeah. this. and he's like, look, I don't give a shit about your demon stuff. We've just got to keep firing guns at this one point, please. Yeah. Yeah. And he just gets sick and tired of Horus basically doing all this demon shenanigans and yeah. stuff when they're tr- when he's trying to fight a real fucking scene. An actual battle. And he's just like, fine, if that's how you're going to be, you're not going to let me actually do it, then why am I here? Fuck you, bye. Bye. And he literally just packs up, jumps on his ship and buggers off. Yep. So the Iron Warriors... Which but yeah, they end up, as always, they, the rest of them, they then all run away into yep. the Eye of Terror and they come across a planet called Medrengard, I believe is the how you uh, pronounce try it. Try and find out if that's... Um, uh... Or Medrengard. Uh, it's... Basically, yeah, this is where Perturabo holds up and it just becomes like the planet of Iron. It becomes like a sort of a demon forge type world. And eventually, yeah, he ends up becoming a demon primarch almost by default. Right. Because he just hangs out. Yeah, we, don't, just... we don't really know much about Perturabo post-heresy. He no, because he... Because he hasn't really left. As far no. as I'm aware, he's never left Madrengar. Like, no, we haven't he's... seen the pri- both of the non-powered primarchs, really. No. Um, uh, since. No, so both Lorgar and Perturabo have done... Very bugger all. Bugger yeah. all. There's a lot of their, their subordinates who've done obviously done stuff. There's yes, a lot of like the, famous Iron Warriors, big Honsu springs to mind. Honsu's like the most famous. Forex, yeah. people like that, yeah. yeah. So um, the the thing with the Iron Warriors though is uh their their thing being iron within, iron yes. without, they won't tolerate chaos corruption. A lot of them do. Some of them obviously do because obviously there's a whole spectrum. Yeah. But majority, yeah, you're right. A lot of them because it used to be a thing where if they got like a if their arm suddenly turned into a tentacle or something, they cut the they just off. cut the fucker off and yeah. replace it with a bionic. Yeah. Because like, they're like, no, no, we ain't, no, put no, up with that no shit. I didn't sign up for this. this no, is no, not fuck what off. We signed up for. Yeah, yeah. We signed up for to because we didn't believe in our father's dream of what he was creating. Yeah. We didn't sign up to make you guys have the same damn thing. Yeah. So they, the vast majority, they're very of bitter. The very Iron bitter Warriors. about it, the way it all came about. Yeah. Um. And, but I love the Iron Warriors. I think of all the f- the. the if you, I tell you what, it's one of the one of the greatest um things that Warhammer TV has done is the uh short Iron Within, which is about a planet. So it's a planet being attacked by Dark Elder, right? right? And they're losing really badly. It's the people planet, and they're like, oh shit, what do we do? And they're like, right, we'll send out the call to our... We were told that if our planet was ever in trouble, that we should send out this call, and we'll be protected. And they're like, do it. And they do it, and they're kind of like, they're not sure if anything's happening. But there's a couple of times where they're mentioning things like, we'll believe in the iron and the blood, and things like that. And oh, like, right, hang on okay. a minute. Um, then they're like, all of a sudden, they start seeing streaks in the sky as these drop pods come down. They're like, oh, we're safe. The Emperor's angels are here. And yeah, 
no, it's an Iron Warriors sort of battalion. Right. Um, it's really cool. Like the visuals are brilliant. Um, anyway, the sort of main characters, the sort of main Imperial Guard characters, fall back to the palace where the Archon is, the Dark Eldar, because apparently he'd had a deal with the the planetary governor that they could come and raid and basically oh, take a I bunch see. of people, yeah, yeah. but leave all the rich and powerful behind, uh, and they'd execute the governor for that. Anyway, the Archon's all like, "Ha ha, you've got you know, here." It's like you believe. These were you be your saviors. You how easy you forget your own history, because yeah, it was an imperial planet, and they the at the time the loyal chapter or the loyal legion I should say that said made these deal were loyal. They were the but they happened to be the Iron Warriors. So when they sent they hadn't needed this, they sent this signal out ten thousand years later, not realizing that been <laughs> God was going to the nearest Iron Warriors garrison. Um, ah. Then the Iron Warriors will take over, and it, like I said, it's really cool. It if you have one TV, awesome. watch it. It's freaking awesome. Um, it's really well animated. There's some really cool moments. There's like a really cool one of my favorite bits is there's like um a, a, like an an Iron Warriors breacher squad. So they've got like shields like your proper oh, classic yeah, tower yeah. shields but with bolters that fit in yes and there's this really cool moment where they're like duh, 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 and they fire and then like then they take two steps forward and lock in again <laughs> and fight and it just looks really cool that it's, anyway it's, awesome. it's, it's, it's a really awesome idea yeah so I, I like the Iron Warriors yeah I have a little thing for them as much I as like... Perturabo himself I'm a bit of a like yeah, uh, yeah but the Iron Warriors themselves are pretty cool yeah Iron Warriors are awesome um, and that leads us on to what we think is the last one he's not a Primarch Oh, that of like of undivided because yeah, undivided. the other Primarchs that would be undivided for the other the other two legions that are left, which is the Night Lords and the Alpha Legion, are dead. Yep. Hear that Alpha Legion players? <laughs> Hear it? He's dead. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> Both of them are dead. Are you sure? One yes. Time, slightly louder. <laughs> yeah. For those from the back, he is D E D dead. <laughs> One was killed by Gilliman. One was killed by Dawn. This is a fact. Just accept it. None of this, oh, but Alpharius. No, he's dead. Anyway, rant over. So Alpharius and Omegon of the Alpha Legion, yes. who would be Chaos Undivided, yes. are both, c- uh, canon-wise, yes. currently dead. Yes. Everybody's and dead, Dave. Everybody's yeah. dead, Dave. And the other one who would probably be Chaos Undivided, yes. which is the Night Hunter's yeah. Conrad Curse, and he was shot in the head by a... Well, stabbed in the head. Was he stabbed in the head? We don't know exactly. He, 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 he was died. killed by a calendar assassin. And, yeah. and he is definitely dead. There's a scene in it. Yeah. Say now, That's the whole point. The whole yeah. point is of him is that he yeah. gets killed. He gets killed. Because he allows it to happen. Yeah. So that, that would be the other two we believe yes. would probably be Chaos Undivided. Yes, because their legions kind of still are. Mostly. Obviously there'll be warbands that have probably gone, hey, this whole yeah, technical so thing's great. Uh, the Night Lords of... would be a few with Slanesh, a few with Corn. Yeah, a few with uh, Zinchin. So the, 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 same with the Alpha Legion. Probably not many with Nurgle, but... That's the thing. There's always going to be There's always going to be somebody. I'm not going to say the front percent no, there's no Nurgle. Oh, yeah, you can't. Especially when you when you hang intestines all over the place, eventually you're probably going to end up with yeah, getting a bit. I mean, old. probably. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but that leads us on to the probably, arguably, the most important chaos undivided character in the forty first millennium. Abaddon. Abaddon the Despoiler, mm-hmm. master of the Black Legion, current captain of the uh, current vengeful, master of the Vengeful Spirit. spirit yes, or, yeah. um, and various yeah. other titles. Yeah. The, the um, leader of Great uh, Black Crusades. Yes, yeah. thirteen of them. The 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 crasher of uh, Blackstone fortresses. Yes, <laughs> because apparently he can't pilot Blackstone fortresses. No, not really. Well, he um, got his license. Mm. Yeah. He just had the stick that, made, had them the stick, stick yeah. that made them work. Um, <laughs> but yes, Abaddon, obviously an incredibly important character. He was yeah. the first captain of the Sons of Horus. Lunar Wolves. Yeah. What's really interesting is, I would, when I first started reading the Heresy, I couldn't figure out how the character... Because at the beginning of the Heresy, Abaddon's very much like, Daddy's the best. Daddy's so good. I love Daddy. I love Horus. He's amazing. You know, and he's a really bit of a short-tempered, a bit angry, like not really... Doesn't have the kind of vision that he ends up with. And I can never seem to rectify how we got from A to B. And through most of the heresy, he stays the same way. But towards the end, they start writing him really well. And he starts questioning things. He starts being like, his whole thing is, why are we fighting for these these gods? Like, we, we shouldn't do what we're doing. And he sees parts of his legion embracing it and like making themselves possessed, the Lupercali, which are like the, the little inner circle of like possessed marines. And he's like, what the F is this? And yeah, he, he kind of goes, this is not about us anymore, this is about them. And he realises that Chaos will just take over. So he refuses to let that happen. And he kind of, like, does a few things. But yeah, eventually, when they all bugger off to the Eye of Terror, you'd think he would naturally take over 
the remnants of the Sons of Horus. But he doesn't. He disappears for a long time. We don't exactly know what he was up to, but he's kind of basically going on a journey to find himself. Yeah, pretty much. Um, he kind of like trying to figure out his place and what he wants out of life. And then eventually, in as documented in the novel The Town of Horus, when the Sons of Horus are basically being exterminated by the um, Emperor's children during the Legion Wars in the Eye of Terror, he starts putting out feelers to people because he's found... Well, the other thing that's gone missing at this point is the ventral spirit yeah. itself. Yeah, I was going to say... That he um, was, he and it. he sends out a bunch of videos to a few people that he knows think feel the same... He's learned feel the same way about him, that miss the, the brotherhood and the fraternity of the legions of old uh, and, and don't want to really embrace chaos as such. They might have learned, like, they might have embraced some sort of power. So, like, you end up with characters like Leor the, the Fire-Fisted, who is a... Cornate Devastator Captain, which is pretty cool. It's a really different archetype. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember. There's a Saneshi one, um, obviously Kion of the, the Thousand Sons. There's a few of them that he basically kind of brings to him. Falcus Kyber, who was one of the members of the Justerian. He ends up uh, ends up as a possessed, sadly, as, they, as a way to, only way to save them because it was a sort of tele- weird teleporting accident. Oh. But anyway... How very Star Trek. Yeah. So they... They end up like being summoned to where the Vegetal Spirit and the Vegetal Spirit is like, like effectively crashed on a planet. Yeah, it's kind of like semi landed, semi landed, semi merged because yeah. obviously it's the Eye Terror, so it's shit's a bit weird. weird. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's kind of been turned into this weird kind of museum type, laboratory type, just like think sort of crazy mansion on a hill from a like weird sort of loner recluse billionaire yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a bit like that because yeah. Abaddon's got all these sort of trophies from shit that he's done over the like, few hundred years or thousands of years he's been because time flows weirdly uh, like one of the things he's got he's got this weird still that makes an alcohol based off of adrenaline that comes that comes from the adrenaline of space marines like right. adrenal glands of space marines of course it yeah because <laughs> of course as you do, as you do. Uh, I think he's got like an entire carcass of space whale like a skeleton of a space whale in there like you know natural history museum style yeah all sorts of weird things yeah. anyway he brings them together and he's like look we need we need to come together we should bring back start bringing some of these warbands together stop fighting amongst ourselves and go back to the to the Imperium and basically burn it to the ground but not in the ways of our because our fathers were idiots because he literally says Horus was an idiot yeah like, he, he was too obsessed with his own sort of thing, and he let the powers control him. We shouldn't let the powers control us. We should let them work for us. And that's his whole raison d'etre. And this is where he shows him the Talon of Horus, which still has Sanguinius's blood on it, and the Emperor's blood, because it nearly knocks... K- the, the power of the Emperor's blood nearly knocks Kaon out, because being part of Psyche, right. he can sense the power in it. Right. And he's like, oh, sweet mother of God. <laughs> um... Anyway, yeah, so he eventually, they, there's a really cool thing where they managed to raise the ventral spirit yeah. uh, and they uh, attack the planet where Horus' body had been, which the Emperor's children had laid siege to to steal it, to give to Fabius Bile, um, where he'd started cloning the Primarchs and he clones Horus um, and Abaddon basically rips him in half of the town of Horus. Yeah, um, so there's a fight says, between you. Yeah. <laughs> the Horus... The Horus t- Reborn, the, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, Horus Reborn... And Abaddon. Abaddon and Abaddon win. He's like, hell no, get yeah, fucked. None of that. Um, anyway, so then there's another, the next story is about them trying to get out of the Eye of Terror into the real world. Yep. Um, this is where they end up fighting Sigismund, like we, do- we, we talked, talked about, about that previously. Yep. Um, yeah, and ever since then, he's kind of led various large raids, which are known as Black Crusades, for various reasons. I believe the first one, the point of the first one was to find the demon sword Drachnien, which is his awesome sword, which we now know due to the, her- due to the Horus Heresy. Drachnien is the demon of the first murder. It's how when Cain slew Abel, yeah. the, the demon that was created from that act is called Drachnien, and apparently it's the one thing that can utterly kill the Emperor, supposedly. Ah. It's in the Master of Mankind story. You right. don't know how it went from... Because it attacks somebody and ends up in a custody at one point. Right. Um, it's a weird story. Uh, we don't know how it went from that to the sword... Okay, but we know because obviously when we read, when you're like it's the demon of the first murder they talk about phrase and then they go it's called Drachnien and everyone who knows what he went oh what now <laughs> uh, so yeah anyway that's one of the crusades there's a bunch of others that do various things uh, like they all have an objective but they're not always it's not always clear what that objective is the other big important one pre thirteenth is the 12th Black Crusade, also known as the Gothic War. Gothic War. So for those people who have played Battlefleet Gothic, the Gothic sector, the, that, that whole storyline is the 12th Black Crusade, which is, because I believe previous Black Crusades, the, the, the Abaddon Golan had gone to find two artefacts, the Hand of Darkness and the Eye of Night, 
which when combined are actually the control mechanism for the Blackstone Fortresses, which are all dormant, or a bunch of them were dormant in the Gothic sector. So the whole war was about him stealing the Blackstone Fortresses. fortresses. Yeah. Quick side, the Blackstone Fortresses were weapons created, they're known as the Talismans of Vol. They were created by the Elven Smith god Vol to fight the war against the Satan because they can blow up suns. Yes. Um, That's what they're meant to do, because suns were how the Satan fed. They would feed on suns. So by blowing up suns, you could blow up an entire solar system and therefore probably kill Satan as well. Yeah. So they were one of the last sort of weapons against the against the tan and uh, yeah and thinking nicks a bunch of them yeah. <laughs> about nicks a bunch of them now the the thing is they're not even though they have them they're not fully operational i think they can control to a certain respect yeah. but not like it's kind of like the the phalanx where they're yeah. not 100 percent sure what every part yeah of them does. so the thing was that's more of a sort of plot contrivance yeah. because we they knew they were going to be used in the the original Eye of Terror campaign, which was the original 13th Black Crusade storyline, yeah. they were kind of there to be used as a kind of, oh shit, weapon. Yeah. They used, oh no, they used a planet killer, so that's another weapon that he also creates. Yeah. He's literally, he creates a Death Star, effectively. Yeah. Called Everybody the planet needs killer. a Death Star. Yeah. Yeah. He, in, the, in the original 13th Black Crusade, he used it to blow up a couple of planets in the outer areas of the Cadia system. You'll find there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that run through both the Eye of Terror campaign and what we'll talk about in a bit, which is the Storm of Chaos campaign, which was supposed to be the final, like the big Archeon's big crusade. Yeah. They had a bunch of stuff in the wings, like in terms of story, where if the shift, they were based on these worldwide campaigns. Yeah. So if the story had gone a certain way, they could have, they would use, they would say, and this is why, what this thing would have done. But the problem with those World War II campaigns was that it's everybody against chaos. So everyone kind of went, screw you, chaos. And they both, they lost really badly. Yep. So they kind of had some contrivances where stuff happened. Yeah. It's where, it's where when you, when you think about it from a, a, a sensible perspective, yeah. like a game store owner perspective, yeah. it's like, you're going to tell us how your chaos army got on against all these other armies. Yeah. And you're like, uh, then they're going to lose more than they're going to win because we've got three guys that play chaos armies and 27 that don't. Yeah, and even the guys that play orcs are like, well, if we win, we're just going to report for the Imperium. Yeah, we're just going to report for the Imperium because fuck you, chaos. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's the only downside and, and to that, it. So, while it's an awesome idea, yeah. I do love And again, it's an, ep- it's an episode we will talk about, yeah. I want to talk about, is the different worldwide campaigns yes. they did over the years because so, they are fascinating and they also involve well, a lot of them involve really important lore events. Yes. Towards the end, they realised that actually maybe we should just have them be not very important lore events. <laughs> yeah. But uh, sadly, those are the ones that no one really gave a shit about. Yeah. Um, for that exact reason. Yeah. Because they tried to find a way for everyone to have a reason to fight. And everyone was kind of like, eh, I don't care though. Because it's not big and important and cool. Because yeah. they didn't really make it big and important and cool. Yeah, you've got to make it big, important and cool. But unfortunately, but yeah, have the, enough. it's trying to find a balance. Yeah. Have enough of control of the outcome. Yeah. That you get to one of two outcomes two that you already know yeah. where you're going to go from. Mm. Like you, you just have to have just enough sway that you know chaos can win because chaos should win from time to time. Yeah, it is important. Otherwise, which well, that then, like I say, when, we, when they retconned it, which is what yeah. effectively they did with with the new story we are in with Eighth Edition, yeah. chaos did win. Yeah, like the whole this is a Baden's plan. Like a Baden's plan was what is now the Cicatrix Maledictum. Like yeah. he he blew up Cadia. Because he knew that the Blackstone pylons that were on there, which were created by the Necrons, were keeping the Eye of Terror pretty much a- as it was. Yeah. They were like focusing, they could focus, Blackstone can fo- focus warp energy and direct it. So this is one of Abaddon's big things. Yeah. Um, and he realised that and was like, hang on a minute, if we, so if we fuck this planet, right, yeah. then... If we can get rid of, finally get rid yeah. of Cadia, we so can make So it ripped this massive hole in reality across, right across the galaxy instead of just this one hole. And then his second part of the plan, which I think was absolutely brilliant, which is in um, a, a, uh, Watchers of the Throne. Watchers of the Throne, yeah. Where they, they literally only stop it at the very final moment. Was yeah, the last he realised he kind of makes people... He, he le- it, because of this big like flux of demon energy, he, lo- he lets the demon attack loose on terror itself, knowing full well that the response of the Imperium is going to be like, oh my god, terror's under attack again, quick, everybody come here and lock it down. And he that's what he uses as a distraction to fuck Kate. Yeah. Properly, and, and all, while that's happening, while they're yeah. like kind of going into fortress mentality, and being like, "We must protect the whole world. Madden must be coming to kill us all." Because Madden's like, "No, terror is irrelevant." Yeah, like this is why Jan Madden is so genius. Is he's like, "No, what we're actually going to do is he what he does is he goes round various planets around the ter- the Sol system, so various systems around Sol, and plants these blackstone monoliths to effectively make a warp cordon around terror." 
So his plan is actually to cut Terra off from the rest of the galaxy. So there's no ability to warp travel. You can't. You couldn't leave the system via warp travel, which means that you're effectively never going to get anywhere because it's going to take you centuries the conventional way to get anywhere. So yeah, and he got to within the last pylon, like yeah. literally the last pylon was about to be launched when a, a custodian and um, an Athma Sykana force that was basically breaking the rules yeah. went out to go and do to go and stop him. Because yeah. um, they realised what was going on and they didn't have time for the politics and yeah, bollocks. We, so they were like, no, we're just going to do it. We're going to lose if we wait. We're so just going to take this it. ship with some of our, some of our dudes and, fuck and go up. and fight this Black Legion strike yeah. force where we're going to start losing really badly until... Yeah. Ah, Gulliman's arrived. Thank God for yeah. that. Which I do find they do a little bit too much in the early phases of bringing him back. Because yeah. Gulliman doesn't half turn up at like the most... Well, no, he doesn't turn up at that point. No, he, no, he'd already turned up at the on the on the. They, they get reinforced. It was right? it was after. I don't. I think afterwards they 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 literally they fight to the last. And they almost kind of they they win just and the reinforcements turn up and are like, it's more it's a bit like um, Desolation of Bath where yeah. where they've won but they're all like oh my god I'm fucking knackered <laughs> yeah. and that's when the reinforcements turn up and I'm like you have saved us all. But yeah, the point being is that Van's plan was just to cut off Terra because yeah. he realised that without Terra. Without that direction from Terra, the, the Imperium would fall apart. Yeah, it's gone. It would slowly. It would take a long time, but it would slowly fall apart, and he could win that way. And like that's why I love about him so much. He's loads of his genius plans, and his arms now stay on. Yes, the model. Yeah, because the old oh, uh, God, Abaddon yeah. model. Yeah, uh, was metal, mm. and his arms the original would perpetually fall off. Yeah, especially the Talon Horus. It's a big, it's massive, massive claw yeah, that's made of just lead. Like, and it's got, yeah, it's attached just behind the massive part, so it's, yeah. got, it's a weak point. Yep. So his arms would always. I am up. yes. And the uh, new Abaddon model, much oh, better. And his arms, so beautiful. That new model, and I love how it goes together. Like yeah. it's really clever. It's one of those models that's been designed with over over detailing. Yeah. So as you like, it's, I remember going a little side tangent about how much I love this model because okay, the under parts of his. So when you build the model, you build like his undersuit. And it's got all the jet. You can see all the plugs and jacks where the armor would interface with. And then when you build it, you literally put the armor pieces onto. You armor him up as you build it, which I think is really cool. Like you're never going to see the other suit, right? But I love that it's there. Like it's a really cool. It adds story. Nobody can see that I am looking at you in a very strange. I know, moment. but I, I like it. I love as stuff are, like that. You are a friend. Like if you're on my stream, you'll know my love of like weird. storytelling in models. Yes. Whether it's like it's like the Hellhound is one of my favorite yeah. models for that because Dale Stringer, who's an awesome designer and, a, and an engineer, he th- wanted to, he thought about how the model would be like how it would work like in the wider in yeah. thing. So I love how you can see in the design that. It's got this pallet with these four drums on the back, um, where they, this this thing comes down and they lock into the they basically pierce the tops of the drums, they lock into it, and that's where the fuel from the for the hellhound comes in. Yeah. You can see in the design that it's designed so that it would then hinge up, they'd unlock, hinge up, the tailgate comes down, it's got rollers on it, and that the drums are on a pallet, and he said, Look, I remember talking to him about it, and he was like, Yeah, he imagined like Sentinel Power Lifter would come in, take that pallet out, put a new pallet in. Obviously, then the tailgate goes up, the top comes down, pierces the thing. I'm like, again, when you build the model, <laughs> yeah. you when it's finished, you never see any of that. Yeah. But the design is on that. You can yeah, see you can it in see the design. design. And I love that in miniatures. That is awesome, actually. Yeah, I love that in yeah. miniatures design where, yeah, you might not see it, but... It's there. Yeah, it's really cool that you can see... Like, I, I, adds story I, I'm a big lover of pilots in vehicles. Yes, for the I, same I reason. Like, yeah. I like it's the pilot in the vehicle. the story yeah. of the model, even though you know it's not there. Yeah. Um, sometimes you end up like I'm going to make this joke. I'm going to point this out this is Ben Greaves one of my best friends because it used to be like all the old tanks especially the transports had interior detailing that you could paint lovingly if you wanted to um, like again it doesn't need to be you can just glue it shut um, or you can do what Ben did which is both you could paint a loving interior wonderful he did it with a land raider I remember this I never let him forget this because whenever he does a new interior <laughs> on a tank is he painted this beautiful and it was it was lovely it was well, incredibly well painted it had all the detail on it it looked great and then he glued the door shut <laughs> and I will never let him forget it because it's hilarious to me. That is brilliant. Yeah. Yes. It was. Uh, yeah. To what? To this day, somewhere there is this Land Raider that is incredibly well painted interior that no one will ever see. No one will ever know. Only me and Ben have ever seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's a random tangent yes. as usual, but I, so, I love that. We're moving on now. So now. To yes. Warhammer Fantasy. Yes, because Chaos uh, Undivided in Warhammer Fantasy is both diff- d- deeper and more in- more interesting, I yeah. think. Uh, this is the point in the po- in the podcast where we were planning on going switching over to Warhammer Fantasy. Yes, which has quite a deep detailed um, lore of 
uh, Chaos Undivided, which sadly we don't we realise we, we, we don't have time for. We don't yeah. have time for. So now that means it's both good and bad because it yeah. means obviously you can't hear it now. You'll have to no. wait till the next episode. But it means I can go into more detail. Yeah. So you get to now go into. I do the because... whole ever chosen concept because yeah. this is a really one of the really important things. About you probably heard of Archeon, the Ever Chosen. I would hope so. He's not the only one. No. no. In fact, we have both the first and what supposedly is the last Ever Chosen are current characters in both Age of in Age of Sigmar and one of them is in 40k now. But yes. Bellacor. Bellacor. I don't know. Bellacor is the original Ever Chosen of Chaos, and yes. we will go more into detail about what is Never Chosen. Um, Who is Bellacor? What is a Bellacor? Yes. Um, what is Chaos Undivided? How? What does it mean for people of the Warhammer universe? Next time. Yes. yes. So, with that being said, uh, please, if you're listening on YouTube, uh, please give us a, a, a subscribe. I will one day be able to say that word. Like, uh, share, subscribe, mm-hmm. leave a comment, comment. ring the bell yeah, for notifications, because I watch a lot of YouTube yeah, so I'm smelling all, learning the pattern. All that sort of stuff. Yes. Uh, please do that. If you're listening anywhere else, please leave us a review. We would love it. Mm. If you have any questions... Yes, as always, please leave us questions yes, for our please. next Q&A session, which, which will be in several episodes time. Several episodes time. Several episodes time. Nine, eight, seven, six, eight, 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 eight. I can count. Eight. Sorry, Evie's holding on fingers. We're both there going, uh, uh, mass this time of the day. No. Two hands? No. Yeah. But yeah, all those good things, please do those. We would love it forever. Uh, but with that being said, it is good night from me. It's good night from him. And it's good night from her. Good night. Night. Bye.